worship is about to begin. But I'd invite all of you to watch this and listen carefully because there was a few difficult words throughout the service today. And so there might just be a few bloopers. Worship with Trinity Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Amy, and I'm so happy to be worshiping with you today. Today is the 15th of November, and hopefully you've had a chance to download a bulletin. If not, you may do so from our website, which is www.tlcmonticello.org. And when you do have a bulletin in front of you, you will notice that the bold print indicates all read, and there are the notes and words for the songs. Hopefully you can worship fully. Let us open our worship in song, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And And also also with with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Righteous God, our merciful Master, you own the earth and all its people, and you give us all that we have. Inspire us to serve you with justice and wisdom, and prepare us for the joy of the day of your coming. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. And now we hear the word read to us from Scripture. Our reading this morning comes from 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, 
the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. Word of God, word of life. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. Good morning, kids. Good morning. Come on up. It's time for the kids' message, the children's message. Sit right down here by me, will you? I have a few things to show you today. Yes, I do. Because did you just hear what was read? Yes, Jason read to us from 1 Thessalonians. That's a big word. But one of the things really stuck out in what he read. He said, build each other up. Did you hear that part? Well, I have a few things to show you. I have, uh, what is this? That's right, a piece of wood. And a hammer. A hammer. I even have a what? Yes, a handsaw. Well, it's interesting because I have a friend who likes to build things. Do you like to build things? What do you like to build? Really? Have you built a lot of them? Well, I have a friend who likes to build birdhouses out of wood and bookshelves out of wood and even little cars out of wood. Some of those little cars are going to our kids that we're giving boxes to for Operation Christmas Child. Little cars made out of wood. But anyway, my friend likes to build them out of wood, and he has to start with the saw and make a cut, and then he has to use a nail. Okay, well... This is why I don't do crafts. He has to use a nail and a hammer and put his birdhouse together. Well, the interesting thing is, what if he used the saw incorrectly? Would that hurt? It might hurt him, and if he left a really sharp edge, it might hurt someone else too, right? How about a hammer? If he used a hammer incorrectly, well, then he might actually hurt the piece of wood, and it might leave a mark, wouldn't it? He could probably bring that nail back out. But there'll always be a little wound in that wood. And that's like people. We are told to build each other up, make wonderful things with each other, and be happy and encouraging. Now, we could make a birdhouse, we could make a bookshelf, or we could make something that hurts. And so, our lesson for today talks about how we can use the tools that God has given us to do good and to help people. And we are to do that all the time. Build each other up. Because, do you know, words hurt too? Have you heard that before? Well, if I say something mean, I might be able to say, oh, I'm sorry, and take it back. But it's just kind of like my nail hole. It's still here. It made a mark. It hurts somebody. And that's what we don't want to do. So let's try this week to build each other up and say nice things to each other. And like my grandma used to say, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. That's right. That's what grandma used to say. Shall we have a prayer? 
You can repeat after me if you feel comfortable. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you. Thank you. For the Bible. For the Bible. That teaches us. That teaches us. How to build each other up. How to build each other up. Teach me every day. Teach me every day. So I can learn. So I can learn. How to say kind things to others. How to say kind things to others. Help me remember. Help me to remember. Not to tear down. Not to tear down. Or to hurt. Or to hurt. With my words. With my words. And help me. And help me. To build others up. To build others up. As your son Jesus Christ did. As your son Jesus Christ did. Send us your spirit. Send us your spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, kids. That's our lesson for today. You can go back to your seats. Our scripture reading for today comes from the book of Acts as we continue our Acts sermon series. Today, Acts 17. That very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas off to Berea, and when they arrived, they went to the Jewish synagogue. These Jews were more receptive than those in Thessalonica, for they welcomed the message very eagerly and examined the scriptures every day to see whether these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, including not a few Greek men and women of high standing. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? And others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Aragopagus and said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Aragopagus and said, Athenians, see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inherit and inhabit the entire earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. Though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Even as some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, he now commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this... He has given us assurance to all by raising him from the dead.
When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, we will hear you again about this word of God, word of life. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. Grace and peace to you this day from God the Creator, Christ our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit our Sustainer. Amen. People have different ideas about God. Our ideas about God often determine how we respond and how we relate to God. And in many cases, how we relate to each other. Isn't that true? Is God strict and mean? Or all forgiving, no matter what we do? Can we appease or please God with personal sacrifices or good works? Does God care if we worship or not? Does God care how we worship, how we commune, how we gather? Does God care if we only dedicate one hour a week to praise or prayer? Or maybe once a month we get our God fix. Or maybe a couple times a year. Or when we're really desperate. Mom's in the hospital or something. Ever ask kids what questions they have about God, ask them sometime. It's interesting. You might be surprised. I've heard, does God sleep? Does God ever forget me? If I pray more, does he hear more? And once I heard a troubled teen ask, how can God care about me? I don't even care about me most of the time. How we think about God matters because it's often what determines a lot. How we live and act in the present and in regard to the future. If we see ourselves equal to God, or at least worthy of praise and adoration, similar to God, well, it often informs whether we live in fear and anger and doubt or whether we live in hope and joy and peace. This fall, we have been studying the book of Acts and how the first century church lived and witnessed in a very topsy-turvy world. And we can relate. In order to learn and hear the gospel in new ways, we learn from Christ's first church. And we're over halfway through, and here's where it gets really good. For in Acts 17, the Apostle Paul is on the run. He has been kicked out of a couple of cities, and he is supposed to be laying low now in Athens. It's a funny passage. With our postmodern ears, we might miss the humor here. But the writer of Acts takes great pains to tell how Paul stirred up the people, stirred up trouble, It was kind of an akin to a bar brawl in Thessalonica. And believers sent Paul and Silas to a little town, Berea. Hide out there. Go there and hide out. Go to Berea. Well, Paul being Paul goes instead to a little country synagogue and starts to preach there too. And like the circus coming to town, the country Greeks welcome Paul and Silas and their entourage, and they're excited by their presence and their message. A number even become believers. But then the stodgy old pillars of the community hear of it, and oops, Paul, grab your coat, and don't let the door hit you on the... This time Paul leaves alone. Silas is in Berea, and Timothy is left in Thessalonica. And they're paying the bills and picking up the pieces and calming the crowd. And Paul, just take a few weeks off, man. Kick off your sandals and lay low. Have a beverage. See a show. We'll clean up the messes. No, Paul doesn't go to Athens to preach. He's just going to Athens to wait for Silas and Timothy while things cool off. While things cool off in Thessalonica and Berea. But again, 
He cannot restrain himself. The man does not know how to relax. Athens should be a vacation. Athens was a huge city of grandeur, culture, art, columns, exquisite architecture. Athens by the sea, with its miles and miles of sandy beaches. Can't you just picture it? Doesn't it sound nice? Oh, yes, Paul takes the sightseeing tours. He goes to those open-air markets, and he talks to the locals. He walks around what might have been Paris or London or New York City of its day. And sure, no one would have even noticed him there in the hustle and bustle. But Paul cannot resist the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus, share the resurrection story. I could almost hear Timothy saying to him on the hotel phone, Darn it, Paul, can't you just enjoy the scenery and give us a couple of weeks to catch up? Paul is fascinated by the locals, especially their religious vitality. But he feels they are misguided. They have so many wrong concepts of God. These are devout and religious folks, passionate even, but they are misled, off track, ill-advised. Paul explains some things to these people, and so to us, about their unknown God. Paul uses terminology to define the triune God in their language. You might not know him, Paul says. You might think unknown. But this most sacred God, I know, says Paul. And let me tell you about God, the one and only true God. True God from true God, begotten, not made. And Paul begins to preach one of his most critical sermons ever. Now we read a number of Paul's letters in church, and you can read from your Bible the scriptures of Paul's letters. But we rarely hear him preach. But in Athens, of all places, a place mentioned only one other time in the entire New Testament. The city that is considered the birthplace of democracy and Western civilization. There, Paul preaches. He says, we cannot manipulate God or bargain with him to get him to do what we want. Because God has made everything. Acts 17, verse 24. The God who made the world and all things in it. God does not need your pillars and your buildings, Paul tells us. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with hands. God doesn't even need your service. Your neighbor might, but God doesn't. Verse 25, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. No, quite the contrary. Everything depends on God, not the other way around. God is the giver. All that we have, all that we are, is a gift from God. And so we should be in thankfulness coming to God in praise. For God is the source and the cause. He is the higher power. What does it say in John chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the world became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the one only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The strange unknown creating God is not only a possibility, but a reality embodied in the spoken word, the written word, and in Christ Jesus. And this mystery God, this mystery God created people and plants and animals and stars. He gave us breath and heartbeats and brains and talents and abilities. Our children, our homes, our pets, our sources of livelihood. 
Everything comes from God. This warrants this God alone, total lordship and our worship. We ought to listen and to pay attention. He's not a pretend thing. If you don't serve well, God will raise up children of Abraham from stones. That's what Christ says. And this God, the only true God, is not stuck in a box or an altar or a building somewhere. He does not need cathedrals and special physical temples from us. We are the temple. And we are the ones who need him. Since God is very real, and since we are the ones who need him, it follows that we should be looking to know and understand God and to have a relationship with God. We ought to understand what does Paul say in Acts 17, 26, and 27? And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth that they would seek God, that they might grope for him and find him. God's requirements of all people are the same. God's purpose for creating you and for creating me is the same, to seek him. Now, God's not playing hide and seek. God wants to be found. God wants to have a relationship with you. God always hears you and never leaves you. Verse 27, God is not far from each one of us. For we are God's children. The Greeks use the word offspring, so Paul does too. He repurposes that word. For in Acts, the Greeks are the offspring of God, and they understand. And so do we also understand we are the children of God. Not only is God close to us, but we are related. That small, immediate family circle that we are encouraged to keep to only these days, well, that includes God. For God has included you first. And in God, everything is as it should be. For in him, we live and move and have our being. To God be the glory. Amen. abiding presence with us, we lift our prayers to God for the church, the world, and all in need. Lord of the church, build us up. Build up your people with the passion of your love. And by the fire of your Holy Spirit, O oh God, unify us in ministries 
our varying congregations of all aspects across the world. May we participate in your work and bring you glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of creation, we stand in awe of you and of the works of your hands, and we praise you for the beauty in nature. Help us to continue to restore this earth to what you had intended. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord of the nations, send forth your justice in the ears of all leaders. Give each compassion and understanding. Give each the desire to work with one another and increase concern for those that are most vulnerable. We ask your special blessing on those international leaders that continue to forge agreements for your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord of all in need, Search out those who cry for you and cry to you in their distress. We ask that you scatter the heavy clouds of depression and addiction and chronic illness and unemployment and COVID and loneliness. Scatter it with your radiant light and send us encouragement and help us to encourage others. Lord, in your mercy, Hear, Hear our, our prayer. prayer. Receive our prayers in the name of the one who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, recognizing that all we have comes from God, we have an opportunity to offer back to God a portion of what we are blessed with. And we ask that God receive it, multiply it, and send it forth from this congregation to do God's work. God bless our offering today. And thank you so much to Amy Clatt for her musical offering.
Having received our morning's offering, we offer a prayer. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'd like to draw your attention to a few things that are in your bulletin, and perhaps a few things that are not. It's the time in our worship for announcements. And the first announcement is that the Monticello Community Sharing Tree is happening this year. I know we've announced it a few times, but it is a reminder that if you would like to participate, they are collecting monetary donations this year and then being used to purchase script cards which will be delivered to families in need so that they can purchase their own Christmas gifts for each other. Checks can be mailed to TLC, or you can give through the Tithely app. Just please mark it special appeal or sharing tree. And our next announcement is that outdoor services have concluded due to the colder temperatures and also to the rising COVID numbers locally. They will resume in the spring or whenever it is safe. And we pray for a quick um, acceptance and use of the vaccine. Online worship will continue to be available through YouTube. And so our COVID-19 preparedness team does continue to review the updated guidelines for reopening the building and also for making building adjustments as practically and financially feasible. They will keep the congregation informed about any decisions that need to be made. And then additional, we have an invitation to the 2021 stewardship campaign. A packet will be coming out to you in the mail. Please start to pray about your commitment to your church and what that might look like financially for next year. We encourage all to stay engaged by worshiping online, to stay connected through Zoom and through phone conversations, and to stay informed by reading our monthly newsletter, the emails that come out, the bulletin announcements, and asking questions if you're ever unsure. And first and foremost, stay safe. Your church cares for you. And we know that COVID is running through a number of our churches in the area. Please be safe, be careful, stay engaged. And that's all the announcements that I have for today. So I'd invite you to receive a blessing. The Lord bless you, encourage you, and uplift you. By the grace of God, and living in the example of Jesus Christ, may the Holy Spirit fill you with joy and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Let us join in singing our closing song, Build Us Up, Lord. Thank you. 
to God. Now all the Athanasians. <laughs> now all the Athanasians? No, <laughs> Now all the Athanasians. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm going to die. <laughs> now all the Athenians. <laughs> okay. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time.